Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Preet Anand, and we're going to be talking about burritos. Just kidding. We're going to be talking about how to design for safety. During this, we're going to talk about first, why is safety important? Uh, which hopefully I don't have to convince you of, but it's still important for us to just rehash this. Next, we're going to talk through six steps to design for safety that you should be applying as part of your product development process. And then we're going to walk through a case study together, the case study of Chipotle and how they've adapted to the COVID pandemic. So first, who am I? Um, I was the first hire for Lyft in risk and safety. I founded the space um, and now there's over 75 people working in technology for safety at Lyft. And this involves preventing car accidents, this involves preventing in-vehicle trauma and harassment, and also stopping the transmission of COVID-19. And this is in addition to all the amazing people inside of Lyft, which there are many, uh, who are focused on uh, providing great customer support in the event something happens so that we, we can urgently and effectively handle an issue. Today, I lead product for Lyft's health safety program. I'm also the co-owner and president of Snug, a daily check-in service for seniors living alone. Uh, Snug is sort of like the anti-life alert, whereas life alert is a physical device that seniors have to wear around their neck, makes them look old, very much, you know, scare tactic oriented, I fall and I can't get up. Snug is the opposite. Snug um, is designed for the smartphone, is designed for seniors who are living independently successfully. Um, and Snug takes action if someone doesn't check in. It works by checking in on them at a pre-selected time every day. And if they don't check in, then Snug takes action by notifying someone to check in on that person. It's the opposite of Life Alert where you have to be wearing it, which a lot of people don't, uh, and then you have to go press it. And uh, Snug has seen a lot of success so far this year, uh, growing more than three and a half times. Before Lyft and Snug, I founded Patronus, which was a company focused on making 911 calls smarter. Smarter by routing you to the closest dispatcher based on where you are, and smarter by providing them all the information needed about you, including your location. We sold that to Rapid SOS, who now powers emergency calling for Apple and a lot of other people inside the country, and they've saved over 6,000 lives so far. Uh, couldn't be more proud to be part of that. And then last but not least, I'm the creator of reportjohn.org, uh, which is a effectively no code tool using Zapier and uh, Typeform uh, to report uh, incidents of sex trafficking. And this is used by the city of Oakland and San Jose uh, to fight sex trafficking and in particular fight demand for sex trafficking. Really proud of this one too because this only cost the city $60 a month and we were able to stand it up in less than a month, um, which is a really great example of the power of technology and what we can do to enhance safety. Clearly, you can see I'm really passionate about this. Um, and this is all part of sort of my bigger personal mission, uh, which I call perpetuating free will. And my belief is that by enhancing safety, I'm giving people more choices, especially because true safety is psychological safety. And by giving them more choices, I'm giving people uh, more freedom to live the life they want. And that perpetuates free will. That's my own view and how I approach this. So now let's talk about why safety is important. Well, first, COVID. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you are all consuming this not in your normal place of work. Uh, you'll be watching this talk at home, uh, maybe in a different place than where you normally live in general, uh, because COVID has changed so much about how we do what we do. And it's all because of safety. We, the risks of COVID have made us uh, change our practices. Uh, because we don't want to transmit the disease, we don't want to catch the disease, and we ultimately want to prevent trauma. And so clearly, safety is critical and has changed how we all are living right now. But even past COVID, safety is really, really important to have as part of your product philosophy, especially if you're working in a product where, uh, or service where people can die uh, if you don't take this seriously. Things like construction, things like health, things like transportation. So here are the reasons why safety is critical. First, it's just ethically the right thing to do. If you're not considering safety, you're being complicit in safety risks. Second, growth. If a prospective customer doesn't feel something safe, they're not even gonna try it. In the 1990s, a lot of people 
didn't participate in e-commerce because they're worried their credit cards are going to get stolen. That is a safety and trust risk. Next, retention. If someone has an unsafe experience, that's a churn event. Um, online harassment does turn a lot of people off of a lot of online platforms. And so by thinking this through, you are creating the conditions that your business can keep growing and your service can keep growing and you can keep providing value to your customers. And then last but not least, cost. Um, insurance is expensive. We know this at Lyft. We know this in a lot of other industries. Legal cost is expensive. And brand damage, also very expensive. We'll see a little bit more about this in the Chipotle case study. Now, let's talk about the six steps to design for safety. First, decide your ideal outcome. What do you want? What is your goal for your product overall, your service overall? But what does safety mean? Because safety can mean a lot of different things. In Lyft's case, it's about making sure things are safe inside the vehicle. Like I told you before, no car accidents, no harassment, no in-vehicle trauma, preventing the transmission of COVID-19, and making people feel safe transporting. Um, you know, in Chipotle's case, it's making sure there's not things like E. coli and food poisoning. Um, so be clear for your business, that can mean a lot of different things. And understand the operation you're in. Is it an attribute of your service? Or is your service itself? In Lyft's case, safety is an attribute. It's an attribute of providing great transportation. In Snug's case, the service itself is about safety and security. That is what we're fundamentally providing the customer. So what promise do you want to make? And I think this quote on the, on the right is really valuable. In order to improve your game, you must study the end game before everything else. So start here. This is step one. Step two, pick the authority you'll follow. This is really important if you're adapting safety practices rapidly and you're applying research. There's unfortunately a lot of bad advice out there. And so decide which authority you're going to follow, whether that's someone like the CDC, a government authority, academic, internal research, um, industry research. Really understand that. And if you're not sure, the way to start on this is understand who regulates your area. Find highly regarded research journals and study who your inspiration, not necessarily competition, but your inspiration, who do they cite when they're thinking about uh, safety and what safety interventions to be applying? You can see in this case, it's the CDC. Now, this is where that ideal outcome, that authority you're following, that research, now this is where the rubber meets the road. Now let's design the experience. Get really specific. Map your user journey. Design for safety and layers. And on this point about safety and layers, uh, let me give you an example. Face masks and social distancing. If you think about it, social distancing, if everyone's doing it, should be enough. They should be far enough apart that there shouldn't be any concern about air being transmitted and thus any risk of COVID-19 infection. But Unfortunately, there's a chance people get close together or there's environments where you can't get, uh, where you have to be closer together. And this is where the face masks come in. It's yet another thing. And this is what I call safety and layers, where these two together bring down that overall risk, that you're adding some redundancy that is then incremental in risk mitigation. So think about how you apply this for your product or service. So again, more on designing experience. What are the questions to ask? Um, and these aren't all of them, but these are some to help you get started. As always, who am I designing for? What's their current end-to-end -end experience, both within your product, but also within those alternatives? What do they want? What are their goals? Um, right now, for example, in a retail environment, people still just want to buy the thing they want to do. But with COVID, they need to change how they practice things. They need to come in with a mask. So it's important to keep in mind what they want as well as what they have to do. What's my ideal outcome? What feeling do I want them to have? And, and just to pause here for a second, that feeling is really important. True safety, again, is a feeling. It's psychological safety. It's comfort. So you don't just want them to not have something bad happen. You also want them to feel good. You want them to feel safe. So this is really, really important. What systems do I want to get feedback? And then again, part of that safety and layers how can I put low friction redundancy in place? 
All right, next step. We've got our ideal outcome. We know whose authority we're following. We've designed the experience. Now let's talk about it. Communicate and say why. And the reason why for this is you're earning trust and you're setting expectations. Earning trust from the people who are happy to know you're caring about safety, you're getting more of that positive feeling from them, and then you're setting expectations with the people who are a little bit on the fence. Because some people, if they don't comply, at least now you've set expectations and consequences. But also, some folks, they just need the reason why. Behavioral economics has shown that if you're asking for something and you specify a reason, people are more likely to say yes. So this goes a long way. The way to do it, first, just state what you're doing and what you expect and put it in a highly visible area. Not necessarily in a blocking way, but in a visible way. Provide access for more information for those folks who are on the fence who are maybe a little bit anxious. Why not give them more information so that way they can feel peace of mind? And then last but not least, when you're practicing this, don't be reactive. These are top of mind for a lot of people. Waiting for someone to ask for it, or worse, waiting for something bad to happen, is just not setting you up for success. An example of someone who's done this really well is Instant Pot. Um, if you don't remember, pressure cookers used to be something very unpopular, very uh, something people didn't have because they were afraid of them blowing up in a safety incident. And so Instant Pot has dramatically grown the market because it's an amazing product, but also because they've designed a lot with safety as part of that product experience. And you can see they merchandise it very clearly. At the bottom there, that's their Amazon listing, and they talk about that they're UL certified with 11 safety features to provide peace of mind. Step five. Again, now we have our, we've, we have a goal, we have the authority we're following, we've designed the experience, we've, we're talking about it. Now we need to think through the failure case because unfortunately, something will go wrong. And it's better by thinking proactively about this. This is your chance to save the relationship rather than having that customer leave you forever. And a way to do this is first is do a pre-mortem. Ask what can go wrong. You're doing your initiative, you're, you're changing your service to improve it. Ask yourself what can go wrong. And then as you're going through all that, what would mitigate that risk? There might be strategies you can employ that will make that risk go away. Again, through that safety and layers, or maybe some sort of like quick catch of something that could go wrong. Maybe can you create a contingency plan with your support team? An example of someone who I think does this really nicely is Phil's coffee. Uh, when they hand you their co your coffee, pre-COVID example, by the way, but when they hand you your coffee, they tell you to take a taste, you take it and they ask, did we get it perfect? And what they're doing is they're facilitating you to say if they didn't, because then they can make it right there and then, and they've protected the relationship. They've kept your trust in fills. And this is a mindset shift as they're thinking beyond the transaction of that specific cup of coffee. And they're thinking about your relationship with fills. And last but not least, create a scorecard to measure. Because at this point, right, again, you've, uh, you've decided your goal, you followed your authority, you have designed the experience, you've communicated why, you've thought through the failure case, now let's measure. Because measurement enables a way to know progress and to guide future prioritization. Uh, I'm probably preaching the choir here about measurement being important, but it's just such an important thing. So the way to do this though, because on safety this is nuanced, is revisit that experience you've designed in those failure cases. Make sure you are structuring data for both of those. What does good look like? What does bad look like? And bad with those failure cases. Also, ask for feedback. You wanna capture that feeling. How does someone feel about the experience? Structure that data. And sometimes that data is not something you already yourself have available. And so you might need to partner with someone who provides you some of those analytics. Um, in road safety, for example, and preventing car accidents, telematics is something used by a lot of companies um, to be able to get high frequency leading indicators about risk. Because ideally, safety issues aren't happening that frequently, but you need leading indicators to understand what that predictive risk might be. Uh, you know, we've worked with companies like Zendrive and Cambridge Mobile Telematics at different points. So there's a lot of different vendors out there that can help you get leading indicators of risk as well. And then last but not least, set up a review cadence. 
Again, what it's measured gets managed, but also out of sight means out of mind. And safety is not something you can have out of mind. So setting up that review cadence, talking about this helps ensure that you prioritize it, helps ensure that you work on it. All right, let's recap the steps. And I know I've been recapping it throughout this journey. Number one, decide the ideal outcome. Number two, pick the authority you will follow. Number three, design the experience. Number four, communicate and say why. Number five, think through that failure case. And number six, create a scorecard to measure this. Told you burritos would come back. We're gonna go through Chipotle's case study now. And we're gonna go through how they've applied these different six steps. Some context though, that's really important with Chipotle is they've had a history with safety. In 2015, they had a multi-state outbreak of E. coli with over 400 people sick. And they went from their stock price high over $700 in late 2015 to the stock falling more than 60%, going as far as 273 in November 2017. The stock price fell, revenue also fell dramatically, um, down 22.4% through 2017 with fewer customers even coming to the stores. And this ultimately resulted in the board changing and the founder stepping down as CEO. So this has been a big part of Chipotle's history and something they take very, very seriously now, as we'll see. So step one, deciding their ideal outcome. In Chipotle's case, the ideal outcome was to continue to operate during COVID and grow while minimizing COVID-19 transmission. Their new CEO, Brian Nichol, talked about this in their Q1 earnings call and their Q2 earnings call. In Q1, they said, our goal is to judiciously invest in key areas so that when we come out the other side, we will emerge even stronger. And then in their Q2 earnings call, our top priorities for the rest of the year include safely running our restaurants and reopening dining rooms using best practices. So they have clarity on their ideal outcome here. On two, for them, it's the FDA, CDC, and local government. That's their governing authorities and go. But what they've also done in their approach is they've adapted best practices from other areas. And what Carrie Bridges, their vice president of food safety says is, I'm lucky to work with some of the country's most established authorities to ensure our food safety standards continue to be best in class. By adapting techniques and protocols from the worlds of healthcare to fine dining, there's no doubt that Chipotle's food safety work is cutting edge. So they have their authorities are following, but they're also clearly taking inspiration from the world of healthcare. Step three, designing the experience. So in Chipotle's case, they have a lot of different constituents to solve for. They have delivery workers, they have in-restaurant staff, they have dine-in patrons, they have delivery patrons, uh, people who are receiving a delivery of Chipotle food, um, they have suppliers. So they have to solve for a lot of different folks. But one of the things they do is in their restaurant, they post this food safety seven that you can see on the right. I'll walk through how they have experiences for the different constituents. For guests, you know, as I said before, patrons, um, they have tamper evident bags now. They're doing contactless delivery and pickup. And they're also doing social distancing in restaurants. And this contactless delivery and pickup is a big one in that this is how people have still been able to get Chipotle's core product, food, during this time period. Is while they might not be dining in, they've now in, Chipotle has invested in delivery and pickup so people can still get that food. For employees in the store, they're doing daily wellness checks. They are making sure the standards are high. They're sanitizing. They're cooking in small batches. This is important for both freshness but also in the event something is wrong, in case there's something contaminated, you're having less spread. They're ensuring gloves and hand washing, and they're also having state-of-the-art air purification. And reviewing what we talked about before on that communicating why, that daily wellness check is not fun for their employees, I'm sure. But by communicating why, that's how they get buy-in. That's how they get adherence and how they can keep operating safely. And then last but not least, they're doing a lot for their suppliers too. 
because that's another one of the constituents that you do, including the ingredient traceability, which I was personally very fascinated by. Now, going back to talking about why, in Chipotle's case, as they say on the right, we already take steps to ensure safety because of their history, but we're also taking new steps to set a new safety standard. And Chipotle's operations have had to change because of COVID, like a lot of ours, and communicating widely keeps, gives people trust that they should order from safety, from, not safety, that they should order from Chipotle, but it also gets that buy-in from both their suppliers, their employees, and their delivery workers. And that ultimately is how it supports their ideal goal and their ideal outcome, which is to keep coming out the other side stronger. Step five, thinking through the failure case. Chipotle does something I think very smart in this space. They preempt something very bad, which would be food poisoning, by using the tamper seal on the delivery package. And if that seal has been tampered with, it's very evident to you and then you will notice. And that way then you call support and support can intervene quickly and again, protect the relationship. Because it's much worse for someone to get food poisoning than it is to just have them get Chipotle reordered. If you get food poisoning, you're probably never going back. But if you have to get your food reordered, you're probably thankful that Chipotle helped you out and you're probably gonna be much more forgiving. So this was something really smart on how Chipotle thought through that failure case and then was able to protect growth, uh, but also mitigate something bad. And another one is on the care for their people. Again, another failure case is that their people might unfortunately get infected with COVID-19. And by expanding emergency leave, giving their employees access to healthcare experts, and even investing in compensation, they're making sure their workers feel comfortable continuing to come into work such that if something bad does happen, they know that Chipotle has their back. So they've thought through this failure case really well. And then last but not least, step six, they are creating a scorecard to measure. I'm sure these things on the left are some of the things that Chipotle is measuring, percentage of dig digital orders, store closures, support calls, percentage of loyalty members ordering, and employee turnover. And you can see in part of the earnings call with CEO Brian Nickel, he is mentioning the restaurants that are remain, remaining closed and clearly measuring that channel mix as well. And this has all resulted in Chipotle really emerging out the other side stronger. They've come back into year over year growth and their stock is higher than that previous point of 720. They're now at 1220. Um, obviously the stock market's doing some crazy things right now, but their revenue has grown year over year, which is very compelling and very powerful. And so by thinking through safety very deeply and adapting to it and applying those six steps, um, Chipotle is in a very powerful position that has grown even amidst the COVID uh, crisis. So we covered why safety is important. We covered the six steps to design for safety, and we covered Chipotle's case study. I hope this has been very, very valuable for you. And I just want to underscore, <clears throat> if you're working in a serious product area where someone can be hurt or their life can be degraded if something goes wrong, it's critical that your team makes safe design a default part of your product philosophy. And if you're interested in talking more, email me at preet at snugsafety.com. I'd be happy to help give more perspective. Thank you very much.